Okay, intermolecular forces. Now we have seen this before in our, our organic unit, but I'll review. Um, London dispersion forces. So these are the attractions that occur between protons in atoms of one molecule and the electrons that exist in a neighboring molecule. And so there'll be an attraction, electrostatic attraction, positive and negative here, attracting. Now, are there protons in the neighboring molecule? Sure there are, all atoms have protons in the nuclei. And are there electrons in the first molecule I drew? Absolutely. And so we're also experiencing attractions between protons in the molecule in the bottom here and electrons in the top. These are weak forces by nature. All molecules experience them because all molecules are made up of atoms and all atoms are made up of protons and electrons. So what will increase or affect the strength of the London dispersion forces? The number of electrons. So as a molecule increases in size or total number of electrons, we will see the London force increase in strength. So I'm asking you here, given this data, to explain the trend in boiling point. So you're being given the boiling point. See if you can explain then why I2 has a higher boiling point than Cl2. Okay, so looking at the periodic table, we see chlorine has atomic number 17. That means 17 protons in each chlorine nucleus and 17 electrons in total for each chlorine atom. With two chlorine atoms in the molecule, that's a total of 34 electrons coming from 17 times two. For iodine, a similar analysis shows us that there's 108 electrons. Both of these molecules are nonpolar molecules and therefore only London forces are considered. Um, and so when we have 108 electrons, there will be stronger London forces between I2 molecules compared to the chlorine. Okay, so next force, dipole-dipole force. So here we have an attraction between the opposite charges of dipoles of polar molecules. So if this is the partially negative end and then we have the partially positive end of this molecule, then a second polar molecule here is going to orient its positive partially positive end nearby. And so we get an electrostatic attraction between the partially negative and partially positive ends of adjacent molecules. We refer to those, the separation, partial separation of charge in the molecule as a dipole, and so it's the attraction then between one end of one dipole and surrounding dipoles of surrounding molecules. So molecules must be polar in order to experience dipole-dipole attractions. This is a stronger attraction than the London force, but not as strong as a hydrogen bond. How do we increase the strength of the dipole-dipole force? Well, we need to see a greater molecular dipole. So essentially, the more polar the molecule, so when there's an increase in polarity, the more polar the molecule, the greater the strength of the dipole-dipole attraction. So have a look at CH2O and C2H6. You'll see the boiling points are stated. I'm asking you to explain the trend. Include diagrams, um, include a molecular polarity analysis, and intermolecular forces. Explanation. Okay, so I've drawn both structures and I went straight to the Vesper shape. So if you needed to draw the Lewis diagram first, that's fine. Um, I went straight to the Vesper shape. So I assigned bond dipoles. You'll notice the carbon-oxygen bond dipole was longer than the CH. The CH difference is 0 0.4. It's very small. So I've drawn those vectors very, very small. There's almost nonpolar bonds, very weakly polar. So if we were to do vector addition here, hopefully you can see that even in this trigonal plan planar arrangement, the bonded atoms are not the same. The bond dipoles are not of equal length and pointing all in the same direction or orientation. So in fact, we have, we have a, a resultant vector. And so the resultant vector, I'll show in green here, 
right, which is essentially coming up through the middle of this molecule. I don't quite like how this looked. Let's try that again. So I had essentially these two nonpolar vectors, right, and then the, the straight one up there. So essentially started here, finished here, and so there's, there's the green. I'm only showing that vector addition because, in fact, it is in two dimensions. For the, and so we have a polar molecule. There's no molecular dipole to draw for C2H6. We know that ethane is an alkane, is a nonpolar molecule. There's great symmetry here, and these tetrahedral carbons have very weakly polar bonds, and that's even a nonpolar bond between the two carbons. But with the symmetry here, these, there is no resultant vector. And so CH2O being a polar molecule does have its London forces, but also dipole-dipole. Whereas C2H6 has a nonpolar molecule, doesn't have the dipole-dipole, only experiences the London forces. The total number of electrons between the two molecules is fairly similar. And so based on London forces, having two more electrons isn't going to be enough to make the London forces in ethane strong enough to justify it having a higher boiling point. And so it's the dipole-dipole forces in the polar CH2O that lead to the higher boiling point. Okay, a second example here. I'm asking you to predict which substance has the stronger dipole-dipole attraction, HCl or HBr. Okay, so I've drawn two molecules of each. I just wanted to emphasize the dipole-dipole attraction occurring between molecules. And now we look at the polarity of the HCl bond and the polarity of the HBr bond. If you're looking up data, you can do that. You can also just look at their positioning on the table and infer with chlorine being closer to fluorine that chlorine would have a higher electronegativity than bromine, which sets up the size of the vector uh, re representing the bond dipole of HCl to be a larger vector than what we would have for the HBr. So I've tried to make this vector longer here. So essentially showing that the HCl molecule is more polar than the HBr molecule. And because of the strength or the, more po the greater polarity in the HCl, we'll see that the partially negative end of the HCl molecule attracts the partially positive end of an adjacent molecule with a stronger attraction. Here's the dipole-dipole attraction right here compared to what we see in the hydrogen bromide. So this is also a dipole-dipole, but it's weaker than the one in the HCl, between the HCl molecules, because HCl is more polar. And so because of that, the dipole-dipole forces between hydrogen chloride molecules are stronger than the dipole-dipole attractions between HBr molecules. Okay, moving on to hydrogen bonding. Okay, so we've seen hydrogen bonding quite frequently in the organic unit. Due to the attraction of a hydrogen that is directly bonded to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, we will have a lone pair on an adjacent electronegative atom attract this hydrogen quite strongly. So hydrogen bonding, which is right here, occurs when a hydrogen is directly bonded to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. So it's this H here that is being attracted with a strong intermolecular attraction by the lone pair on the nitrogen. Does that occur over here between water molecules? Absolutely. And between hydrogen fluoride molecules? Absolutely. Now, are these H's here in ammonia also susceptible to hydrogen bond attractions? Sure they are. And same with these in water. So I've just illustrated it once between the molecules, but in NH3 and H2O, there's an increased capacity for hydrogen bonding. So check out the boiling points that I've provided for you here. This is hydrogen, two hydrogen atoms, with a central atom from group 16 in the bent shape. So look at what happens with the boiling point. So I'm asking you to explain the trend. Okay, so just over here on the right, I've drawn in general a group 
or essential atom X with two hydrogens bonded to it. And in general, we see this bent shape. I've drawn the bond dipoles and started the vector addition, and you can see the resultant vector is the green one here. And so these molecules tend to be polar, which means we're expecting LDF and dipole-dipole attractions. Water, on the other hand, has the ability to hydrogen bond, as we saw up here. And so the ability to hydrogen bond shows us a huge, huge jump in the boiling point of water. Now, does it make sense to you that H2TE would have a boiling point that is greater than H2S? Can you explain the difference here? Although we would anticipate H2S to be the more polar molecule, since sulfur has a higher electronegativity than selenium or tellurium, we see that it has the lowest boiling point um, of these compounds. And so we look at the London forces and realize that there's a significant increase in the number of electrons. And so we propose that H2TE has higher boiling points than H2SE or H2S due to having more electrons. Moving on to ion dipole attractions. You've seen this before when ionic compounds dissolve in water. So we begin by drawing a crystal lattice structure of positive and negative ions arranged at the vertices of a cube in order to minimize the repulsive forces and maximize the attractive forces. All right, so there's our ionic crystal lattice. Now, water molecules are polar, and as those water molecules surround a crystal lattice structure, the partially negative end of the water molecules, the oxygen end, will attract to the positive ion. And as enough water molecules do that, that positive ion will be surrounded by polar water molecules with the oxygen ends pointing in, setting up the electrostatic attraction of positive and negative. And so we call that attraction an ion-dipole attraction. I'll just indicate it here with the green. And so these are hydrated ions. That's what we call this, a hydrated ion. And you can see this green part in here is the ion-dipole attraction. Does it form when you have a negative ion? Absolutely. Now the water molecule needs to orient so that the partially positive end of that molecule, the hydrogen end, is pointing towards that negative ion. And so the ion-dipole attraction forms. So yes, this ion is surrounded by multiple water molecules, all experiencing that hydrogen, sorry, that ion-dipole attraction. Okay, for the next part of the video, I've given you options here of different substances, and I'm looking for you to identify and then be able to illustrate, so draw a picture and label it, of the attractions between each of the following pairs of particles. Pause the video, give it a shot, and then check back. Okay, so methanol and water. Here we have methanol, tetrahedral at the carbon, bent at the oxygen, and the bent water molecule. The hydrogen directly bonded to the oxygen in the hydroxyl functional group of this alcohol is susceptible to a hydrogen bond strength attraction from the lone pair of electrons on the very electronegative oxygen in the water molecule. And so we have a hydrogen bond formed between methanol and water. CH2O is a polar molecule. The molecular dipole is indicated in green. CH3Cl is a polar molecule. The molecular dipole is indicated in green. The black attraction showing between the partially negative end of the one polar molecule and the partially positive end of the other indicates a dipole-dipole attraction. Now, if I was able to shorten this without messing up the diagram, I would because I should be showing this green molecular dipole to be smaller in size because this molecule is not quite as polar as the other. 
Okay, for part C, octane and hexane. Notice that if I draw the complete structural formula, I'm showing all carbons and hydrogens, then I need to show the tetrahedral vesper shape. And that's what's great about these line diagrams is that they show that 109 angle without having to take the time to fill in all the wedges and receding lines. So keep drawing your hydrocarbons with these line structures. Both molecules are nonpolar, and so there's only London forces between them. Here we have a bromide ion and water. That negative bromide ion will experience ion dipole attractions from the po partially positive end of the water molecules, the hydrogen end. So I've labeled it once here so the diagram doesn't get too crowded, but you can see the attractions coming from the hydrogen end to this negative ion. Okay, and now that we've covered everything we have, the bond polarity, molecular shape, molecular polarity, and intermolecular forces, now we can finally answer complex questions about properties of liquids. Two terms are introduced here, cohesive and adhesive forces. Cohesive are, occur, forces occur when we have attraction between like molecules, meaning the same molecule. So water to water, water experiences cohesive forces, hydrogen bonding specifically. Um, methane and an adjacent methane molecule experience London forces between them. That's a cohesive force, very weak one. Adhesive forces, attractions between unlike molecules, so between methanol and water. Hydrogen bonding occurs. That's an adhesive force in that instance because the molecules are different. So there's various properties you're responsible for, and we'll do some demonstrations of these in class, of some of these in class. Capillary action. This occurs in plants when they're able to draw water up from the roots to reach the leaves and higher uh, parts of the plant. But capillary action, think of a long, thin tube, and then the level of water rising up that tube. So when you think of cohesive forces, we're thinking of attraction between water molecules, and then adhesive forces. So why is the water actually rising up the tube? Think that the, the tube, the glass tube that this is made of is uh, it has a certain molecular structure, right? So we have the glass. And then the water that's actually in here has the bent water molecule. So what types of interactions do you think are happening between the water and the glass in order for this water to rise up the tube? It's not being pushed up there. It's essentially being drawn up there by attractive cohesive forces between the water and the glass. So this occurs in narrow tubules and we'll demonstrate this one in class, strong cohesive forces. So I want you to keep this question in mind that I wrote up by the table, by the title. How does the strength of the intermolecular force relate to each property? So as we have stronger cohesive forces, for example, hydrogen bonding, we'll see greater capillary action. Okay, looking at boiling point, this is a very familiar one. I'm sure you can already establish this relationship. As we have stronger intermolecular forces, we'll see an increase in boiling point. Definitely when you do a question about, about these different properties, you'll need to analyze the structure of each substance involved in the question. The point here is just to understand the property and whether stronger or weaker forces lead to this property being higher or lower, stronger or weaker. Meniscus shape refers to, if you think about putting water into a graduated cylinder, it refers to the curved shape of the meniscus. And so essentially, it's the same idea as the capillary action. We have strong adhes adhesive forces between the material that makes up the graduated cylinder and the surface molecules of the liquid. Volatility. So if you have a liquid in an open beaker, how volatile is this liquid? How easily do the particles escape the liquid phase into the gas? 
So I've just defined volatility for you there. It's a measure of the ease with which particles escape the liquid phase. So they move into the, the gas phase. What's the relationship between intermolecular forces and volatility? So think of the liquid particles that make up this liquid and the attractive forces between those particles. Hopefully you're thinking the stronger those intermolecular forces are, the lower the volatility. So if you're making connections back to molecular polarity, then hopefully you're thinking about whether polar or nonpolar molecules are more or less volatile. Okay, viscosity. Viscosity is a measure of the ease of the flow, or sorry, resistance to flow. So we'll just jot that definition down and then think about intermolecular forces. Okay, so if that's the resistance to flow, for example, maple syrup has a greater viscosity than vinegar, what would you say then is the relationship between intermolecular forces and viscosity? Stronger intermolecular forces lead to greater viscosity or lower viscosity? Hopefully you're thinking more viscous. So the stronger the particles attract to one another, the more viscous the liquid. For solubility, you are familiar with this one. It's really determined by the strength of the solute-solvent attractions as compared to the solute-solute or solvent-solvent attractions. So that solute-solvent attraction needs to be at least as strong or stronger than the attractions between solute or between solvent particles in order to have the substances mix and be soluble. Okay, wetting action. Have you ever tr tried to wash the stain out of your, let's say your school sweater on the sleeve and you put just the sleeve in the sink of water or a bucket and you leave the rest of it outside the sink or outside of the bucket. Then you come back a few hours later and there's a puddle of water on the floor. This is a, a result of a property called wetting action. The water has a, moved up, if you will, and wet the rest of the sleeve and moved over the material through the rest of the body of the sweater and onto the floor, even though that part of the sweater wasn't actually immersed in the water. And so this is the idea of wetting action. So again, we see strong adhesive forces between the water molecules and the material that the sweater is made of. You'll see this also with paper towel. Take a piece of paper towel, dip only the corner of it into water, and then watch the water move through the paper towel. Hydrophobicity. I have some very fun, cool hydrophobic sand that you can play with in class. Um, hydrophobicity. So if you remember the idea of hydrophilic and hydrophobic, we're talking about water fearing, right? So the idea of a substance being water fearing or the degree to which a substance fears, fears water. So when you think about polarity here, there are direct implications. So we look at in, increasing nonpolar character, right, as decreasing its attraction for water, therefore increasing the hydrophobicity. So it'll be really fun to play with that sand in class, and we'll do a demonstration of capillary action, surface tension, um, wetting action, and hydrophobicity.